Hey, what's up? It's Mike Squires, and this is the Couchers Podcast. We are up to episode number, I guess, 105. 105. Time really flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Why am I talking like this? My guest on this episode is Terry Date, legendary world-class record producer and mixing engineer, uh, Terry Date, who I had the pleasure of making a record with about nine years ago, I guess, something like that. And um, what a sweet man. We've stayed in touch loosely over the years, never never fell completely out. And it was a real pleasure to have him here on the podcast. He just finished the new Deftones record, which I'm very excited to hear. I heard that new single that came out last week, and it's great. Sounds like the Deftones and Terry Date. I love that. But, you know, you probably know uh, Terry Date's music. If you don't know well, his the records he's worked on, if you don't know just because from the sheerly from you know purely from being a a music nerd and studying like oh this person produced this record blah 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 he worked on uh the early Soundgarden records worked on Pantera records made the a legendary loaded record Casey okay, so yeah, go buy that one um don't buy it used though go download it um go buy <laughs> hey I'll sell you a copy I'm just kidding I don't have a copy to sell you um and you know he also he made this record uh the first metal church record man i wore probably two or three copies of that out when i was in high school sir mix a lot he worked on some of his stuff so crazy so it was a real treat to get to make a record with him when that opportunity came up and uh He's uh he's still working. He's got a world class studio, little mixing room, on his property outside of Seattle in the country. And uh, if you want to work with him, get in touch. You know, maybe you get lucky, kid. Um, listen, I appreciate everyone's support. The podcast is doing really well. Videos are going great, and I'm working on a ton of videos right now. It's very slow going, so I appreciate your patience. Um, I don't have I don't have enough hours in the day to get everything done that I have in my mental list and when I wake up in the morning, but you know, it's ten at night now and I got home from work at you know four thirty and I just have been doing this stuff ever since. So um I appreciate you listening. I appreciate your support. There are a gang of folks who have been pledge supporters, uh, and I would like to thank them right now. You can go to anchor.fm slash couch dash riffs, or there's a link right in the episode that you're listening to right now. Whatever you're listening to, you go to the description. There's a link down at the bottom. Or go to anchor.fm, search for couch riffs, go to couchriffs.com. There's a, there's a way to navigate back from there as well. And uh, you can uh, be a pledge supporter, which is greatly appreciated and enables in ways that you can't imagine. And the reason that this podcast is getting better and better and the reason I'm getting uh, more and more great guests is for that very reason. So thank you guys. And I thank you in advance for your support. Uh, So uh, listen up. Thank you to... Ryan Waters. Uh, Thank you, Hayden Smith. Thank you, Ryan Hooper. Thank you, Jamie McParland. Thank you, Matt Gabs. Thank you, Justin Jones. Thank you, Doug Starkovic. Thank you, Deja Colantuono. Thank you, Adam Pranica. Thank you, Dan Hurst. Thank you, Mike Lacerda. Uh, Thank you, Soto Rebellos. Thank you, Dan Leary. Thank you, Kathy Gerardano. Thank you, Rebecca Pellman. Thank you, Danny Bland. Thank you, Ryan Crace. Thank you, Paul Hutzler. Thank you, Justice Gash. Uh, thank you, Steve Hall. Thank you, Teresa Morgan. Thank you to Rolla Amplifiers. Look forward to a Bob Balch uh, guest spot in a video very soon, and a bunch of other like it's gonna be, it's gonna knock your uh, socks off. It's gonna be great. 
Uh, and thank you very much to River City Guitars, my good, good friends over in Spokane, Washington. The little guitar store that can, will, and could, and did, and does. Um, my guy out there, Bobby, is uh, working hard, tracking down all the hot little numbers that he can get his hands on. Every day is a buying day. If you've got a guitar that you uh, are just sitting on, get a hold of him. You know, Bobby might be interested. Maybe you end up with a new deck or you tile your bathroom or whatever. You know, I don't know what you need money for. Maybe you need to get the Russian gangsters off your trail and uh, you need to unload your 52 no caster. I don't know anything. I don't know enough about vintage guitars to even know if that's a thing. I don't think it is. Uh, maybe it is. Um, but if maybe you have one of those. Bobby knows. He'll he'll be able to sniff out a, a turd in a second. So don't try and sell him any bull crap. But um, get a hold of these guys, all right? You can drop them an email at sales.rivercityguitars.com uh, at gmail.com or uh, give them a call, 509-818-7693. These guys are honest, fun to work with, and I love them. I would not steer you wrong. Now, uh, every week I have a pick of the week that I feature right here in the beginning of the podcast. Uh, and right now, and things are going off, they're flying off the website as fast as he can post them. So, uh, I hope that, uh, I mean, I don't hope this is still there when this episode goes live, because I'm about a few days ahead. But if it is, well, you're in luck, because this is a hot, 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 hot guitar. Uh, what we have here is a uh, a uh, black Gibson Les Paul Custom. Now, we all know that black guitars sound better, right? This is a 1974. This is not like some new custom shop relic thing. This is a... Uh, 1974 vintage custom. Uh, this was a this. This is when Les Pauls were only 20 years old. This is the 20th anniversary Les Paul custom. It is beautiful. Some genius took the pickup covers off the pickups, which I love. I think that's a good look. Exposing the uh, black bobbins on there. It's a very good looking guitar. It's got some John Sykes kind of vibes, you know. Except that it's got a black pick guard. Uh, John Sykes is a super, super duper badass. Um, it does have a mini toggle. I think you can tap probably one of one or both of the pickups. I don't know. This one is a heavy one. This one is about 10 pounds. Just a hair under 10 pounds. You know, you got to have a strong back and a strong will to rock this thing. But... Uh, it's well worth it. This is a hot guitar. It's uh, it's not hot, like stolen hot. It's just hot, you know, like hot. All right. God, why am I still talking? Listen, this guitar is rad. It's priced at $34.99, okay? Uh, you can make them an offer. What's There's no harm in that, right? They either say, yeah, sure, or no, go fish. You know, or, you know, go jump off a bridge. Um, they wouldn't say that. I would say that. They wouldn't. They're too nice. Okay. Uh, we're going to jump into it. All right. Listen, don't forget the golden rule. Do you understand? Nobody, nobody's treating anyone. Uh, every, everyone has lost their way with this golden rule shit. But everyone, everyone wants to be treated uh, well. But nobody wants to treat each other well. So, you know, when you go out in the world, just remember that shit. Don't be a dick. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Take one of these ears out. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great, man. Your studio okay. looks great. Oh, hang on. Oh, I, I was trying to get it i was trying to get a good angle for you here but it's uh oh this is uh this is slick man i mean you painted this picture of like oh well you know i got this little room and i do you know i just got <laughs> i do this well, thing and uh yeah it looks uh looks great oh look at that an ml hanging on the wall 
That's a dime bag ukulele up there. Oh, is it? it's a uke. It's so far away. I can't. I can't wrap my head around the scale. That's a, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's um, this whole place. I built it kind of. I I stole the uh, Studio X blueprint. Yeah. And so you know you can look up. Kind of. Oh, no. Kind of has that vibe. You yeah, know. When uh, I saw that you had a little uh, AC unit up there, and I know those are relatively quiet, but yes. you track some vocals in that room, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's I, I actually have one of those in my um, in my vocal booth, too. Oh, wow. And um, no problem. And usually, I, usually I turn it off, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really not that. It, it doesn't do that much. Right. I mean, you know, most of the stuff I record are screaming into a 58 anyway. So what's the difference, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, way, to, way to talk up your art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Terry, nobody, you know, nobody appreciates a braggart. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I can go there too, but yeah. you know. <laughs> how, how you been? You all right? I've been good. Yeah. You been good? Yeah, I'm good, man. I'm good. It's just, you know. Just like anyone, it's a this is a crazy year. Uh yeah, I I'm I'm lucky that I was finishing this Deftones thing, you know, when the when everything kicked in. So I didn't have to I, I was working right in here, you know, f- really since June of last year. Wow. I never I, I didn't have to leave the room. So um you know, we worked down in LA for uh month and a half maybe um and then brought everything right up here um, you just, you I track to, drums down there? i actually i actually bought this board be, right before they showed up so i had a month in between la and when they came up here to completely wire this thing hook everything up make sure it all worked all that what um, did you have before that a toft is the same I had one? A toft. Yeah, yeah what is this one here this is a neve I, I, so this is this is uh oh, the Neve fifty eighty eight. So you know it's it's the newer knee it's the newest Neve they make. Yeah, uh, make it right in Texas. You know, so I can call the guys up and um, if I need something, I just send it to them, or they send me a replacement. It's just it's a you know it's so much better than an SSL, which I'm more familiar with, you know, I, I would probably be more comfortable working on an SSL, but I don't want to leave a board on all the time when I'm only using it part of the time. Right. And it's just that those ones, these one, this board I can turn on and off every night. Um, it does get pretty hot, but it's a, it's an Eve, you know, it's just, it's taken me a little while to get used to it. But I find that you don't have to do very much with it, really, you know, to make it sound. It sounds good on its own, I guess, is what I'm saying. I, li- so. I wish that I had a guitar like that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Well, I guess I should. Yeah, the, the board sounds good on its own. I guess it depends what you put into it. Sure. You know, is another story. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, but it's fun. I'm glad, you know, I, I'm now that, uh, you know, the, the Seattle studios are kind of blowing down, going away. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, you know, if I were to want, if I wanted to work someplace where I was comfortable, I'd have to go to LA and I just don't really at this stage of my life, I don't want to do that unless it's really important. So. Right. Uh, I remember when you, were you living before this, you were living out by Snohomish or Monroe out that way or like North Bend or something? No, no. I live in, I've been living in Woodenville since 90, 1993. That's all the same to me. Woodenville, <laughs> Snohomish. But you moved places, right? Like seven uh, years ago or so, you you sold and, and bought a new place. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just moved like a quarter of a mile away. I moved from the top of the hill, kind of halfway down the hill. That's a tough, so, that's a tough move because it's all, it's just as much work. 
but you, yeah, but you don't go very far. I, I wouldn't have been able to have this place. My last place had a, a room in the basement, which, you know, was fine for just kind of escaping everybody and closing a door and listening to music. But I couldn't have people over. I couldn't record stuff right. without interrupting the whole house. This one is separated from my house. It's a, it's a separate three car garage that I built a whole second story on. And that's where I am right now is up there. And um, so I'm close enough where I can walk in and out. Uh, you know, it's not like a commute. I can go inside if I want. Um, and far enough away that I'm not bugging Gail. That's you know, awesome. With, and people don't feel like they're interrupting the house when they're screaming really loud. So do you guys have horses there? We have one left. Yeah. One, one horse left. Um, and, uh, yeah, he's, uh, when he's gone, we're done. Oh, let's see. This might be oh, really gonna look out the out. window and see him. I don't know if you can see him out there. Uh, I don't know if I do. I don't, I don't even know if he's out there right now, to tell you the truth. I can't like really it might see be where. Warm oh, there he is right there. Over he's by right the there. corner? Huh? By the corner? Yeah, he's brown and white. Oh, you know, I'm colorblind TD. I think I see him, though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, so we got one left. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, well, that's awesome. Yeah, I... Yeah. We moved out of the out of Brooklyn. I moved up here into the Hudson Valley. Yeah, I've been kind of watching you from and afar. I fantasize about building a little because we don't have a garage. We don't have any outbuilding at all. I have this this room that I'm in is like a it was a deck, and then uh -huh. they just I mean there's no foundation on this. The floor is the decking, <laughs> but yeah. they put flooring over it, subfloor, and then flooring. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, built the walls. So it's real hot, uh, real cold in the winter because, you know, there's no insulation underneath me. Right. Well, you could put that in there. You could throw some under there, right? Yeah, I, I could. But at that point, <laughs> I might as well just like let it be and, and build something yeah. or find a small, find something. Yeah. But I mean, you know, let, who am I kidding? This is fine for me, and I don't need to like. I couldn't mix, uh, you know, cookie batter. So it does like I could I could be in your room and fuck it up. Trust me. Uh, so could I, yeah. you know. But at least you got the room right, you know. <laughs> I got yeah. really excited, Terry, when I think I don't. I must have been the last person on earth to know that you were working on the new. Uh, Deftones record I think I learned oh. about it in November or December yeah well it was uh, we didn't want to make a big deal out of it um because it creates too much pressure on everybody and uh so and it also you know it was much nicer these days to keep thinking I've always I've never been a big social media guy I've always felt like mystery was more fun than you know, everything always out there all the time. But I see uh, so, so many uh, selfies of you. What was that? <laughs> I see so many <laughs> selfies of you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I've just recently, you know, I do, I have a little Instagram account and just kind of out of peer pressure from, you know, from the guys, I, I posted a few things here and there. But I just don't think anything I post is that interesting to anybody but myself. So I just don't want to do it that much. <laughs> right. But the thing is, is uh, that's what social media is. <laughs> just with people with the opposite attitude of yours. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just too old school, I guess. Yeah. I think really... there's a lot of a lack of mystery and a lack of like uh, the, like the old school sexiness of, of a, like a quote rock star was based on the sort of like mystique around them, but nobody's, 
Nobody has any mystique because you know what every person had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner now. Uh, yeah. And where they ate it and, and who they ate it with because it's all it hashtagged. Used, and <laughs> It used to be the only time you could see what was really going on was when you opened up a of a, 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 the jacket of vinyl. Or you looked on the vinyl and yeah. there was like a little booklet or something uh, or the CD uh, or when you saw them in concert or when they got in trouble, you know. And there wasn't right. much else. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely hear about them when they were in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never got in any trouble that was worth a headline. I know. <laughs> I, and I like it that way. Yeah. Uh, I really like the tune that came out on Friday. Ohms. Oh, uh, Ohms, I think. Yeah. Again, I. We were working, we had working titles and I still don't know what the songs, I I know what that song, the real title, uh, the working title was. I know what that song was, but I still, I still have to go through my little list to see, oh, is that, oh, that's what this one's called. Oh, okay. Uh, Are, were the working titles funny? The working titles were all, um, and I don't know how much inside information I should say here. I don't think this is a problem, but. There are these uh, Mexican playing cards. Uh, let's see. There's one. Oh yeah. Uh, and they had a deck. Yeah, they had a deck of these, and so every song had a name, had a card named for it. As a matter of fact, if you look. Oh yeah. Oh, that's great. A, that's the actual working chart back there. That, that's our actual chart back there that I haven't taken down yet. Um, is the record done? Done? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's done and out. I know um, how this shit works. <laughs> Sometimes the record's not done. I mean, in this day and age, like well, how many printed copies are actually shipping out, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, we finished uh, the mixes... I want to say June. Oh yeah. Uh, late June, I think. And uh, then kind of went back and forth with mastering a little bit. And, um, and then it was just a matter of how they were going to handle this, the, the rollout of it. And um, the last I heard was um, uh, maybe September. I'm not sure. So, I mean, I think it has September. a September release, yeah. Yeah. So I I don't know. Uh I just I just am uh concentrating on like sending the guys gear back that I that I borrowed through this whole thing and trying to get them their individual tracks so they can remember what they played on the album, you know, so when the time does come to actually play live again. Right. Uh you know, they'll be ready. So I'm I'm just doing odds and ends like that up here right now. Oh, that's nice. So. That's something that probably I mean when you when you started doing this, that wasn't something that was so easy to do, right? Like if someone was like, "Ah shit, I forgot what I played on the record." You <laughs> you probably I mean, that's like throwing a reel on to a machine soloing out the track letting it play through it's not like just like bounce and then it's output yeah. and you email it that's like that was a did that ever I happen i yeah i can't remember what i used to do back then um probably i had to i probably had to think ahead which was not really a strong suit of mine <laughs> um uh let's see i i think um I might have thought ahead enough to, you know, make individual stems back then. Um, I know I did at some point, you know, uh, throughout through the years where I, I would just make, you know, stems of things. But uh, I think that was more of a from like the 90s on before that. Right. I think if somebody wanted their stuff, I would have to throw a reel up or have this because I'd be gone, have the studio somewhere, throw the reel up and then just bring all the faders up, you know, <laughs> so they could, they could hear it, but it wouldn't sound the same way as when it was mixed. That that's what I 
what I'm guessing anyway. What a pain in the ass. Oh, that was the least, the worst pain in the ass was, I can remember this like, like it was yesterday. Um, after finishing a uh, uh, vulgar display of power down in Texas, hotter than shit. There was no air conditioning in the studio, humid, which you probably are experiencing right about now. You betcha. Um, <laughs> um, and I was waiting for a, for, you know, I, I had a morning flight to fly back home after six weeks being gone. And the guys all wanted copies of the final mixes of the final record. And I'm sitting there. I had to find every cassette deck in the building, which was maybe three. And I had to bounce this, the record in real time. I had to like make copies for everybody on cassettes in real time (laughs) over and (laughs) over. It took me hours to do this and I'm exhausted. I'm burnt out. I'm up, I'm staying up all night long to do this, to catch a morning flight. But, uh, that sucked. That was the worst ever. And, uh, I'm glad that doesn't, we don't have to do that anymore. I bet those guys were pumped on it though. Those guys are pretty excitable. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think I do remember when we went to mastering for that and hearing it, you know, mastered finally. And, you know, how he, Weinberg would play it. He, he would sit us down, mainly Dimebag and, and a couple of the guys from the band. I, I don't know if I was in there that much because I was so tired of listening to it. I didn't want to hear it again. But <laughs> those guys sat right in the middle of the room and how he played as he cut the vinyl. You know, he, you have to play the whole thing continuous side one, right? All the way through while it's cutting and then side two. And he, so they sat there for the whole thing. And I remember them coming out just crying. You know, they were just, so happy, you know, that their record was done. They were happy with it and they were just crying. And so that was, uh, that was a good feeling. That's amazing. I yeah. I love that story. And they're crying for the right reasons too. Right. I guess, <laughs> I guess, I guess I could have been a little interpreted it differently, I suppose. But anyway, I can't imagine anyone making a record with you and crying for any other reason at the end. Well, it's happened <laughs> before, but <laughs> I, I, I blocked those out. Of, because I, you're so I, I mean. To block those, you're I so, you're those so out. mean you made them cry, Terry. <laughs> yeah. I'm, Terry, I was That's so, me. That's me. You know me. That's me. I am so mean <laughs> so that I made mean people cry. And you're a taskmaster. <laughs> I was so nervous to make a record with you. Hmm. I was so nervous because you had this. That's funny. I was nervous to make a record with you, though. <laughs> Because because uh, of true. because of my uh, manly beard, yeah, that's right. At the time, no, uh, no, because of your split second wit, I couldn't keep up with it. <laughs> well, that. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, both of our nerves probably were calmed immediately because you were like, "Oh, this guy's not that funny," and also it's <laughs> not going to get any better. He has already sp- spent all his bullets the first day. And no, then, no, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> there was always new material. I, it was always, always new material. <laughs> uh, but you were you were so easy to be around, and uh, it just was such a calming and fun experience to record. Although when I was in the room and we were doing guitar overdubs, I was always a little nervous just because. Uh, like I know who you've worked with and I was just like, you know, uh, I know where I stand in the sort of on the, on the chart of guitar players, you know, I'm uh, not at the very, very, very bottom. That's like probably, you know, who knows what, but you know, it's always, it's a little bit nervous. Like, Oh man, like this person, that person, then in the other person sat in a chair next to Terry and, committed this song that song and and whatever and and i was just like i can't i gotta i gotta do this right and i remember the there were only a couple things a lot of things were written just like off the cuff in uh, for solos some of them were were pre-written and those ones i remember there was all this pressure i remember one day isaac was like 
no, 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 you don't have to double it now. And I was like, no, 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 I can, I'm going to actually triple this guitar solo. I'm going to triple track this guitar solo. And you were like, uh, and then I just one, two, three, I knocked him out because it was like the only thing I had prepared for because I didn't want to, I didn't want to be disappointing, bef- like in the chair next to you. Uh, no, see the thing, of, I, I don't play an instrument and I, you know that, but, yeah. um, so whenever I'm sitting next to somebody who does play, especially guitar players, I'm always in awe. You know, it's like, how does he do that? I've sat down and tried to do that. My hands do not do what my head tells me to do, you know, tells them to do. I can't like move my appendages separately. You know, I can't, I can't do any of that. So I was always in awe (laughs) myself. doesn't matter who it was. It was just, oh, I was always in awe. And I've, and I think I've told, told you this dime bag story before, but I'll tell you again, but um, because I never played, he was always frustrated with me because I, I, I couldn't keep up with him. You know, I couldn't keep up with what he was doing and um, I, I could, but I mean, he was just always way f- ahead of me. And um, just in terms of like thinking about how it was going to get layered or the steps that it would happen or. And the parts like, of the song, yeah. you know, like him and his brother growing up together, they didn't have to communicate. Right. Uh, they it was just like it was hand signals and eyes they knew exactly they were they thought like one person anyway dimebag would get so frustrated with me sometimes that finally one time he said okay after the studio tonight i'm going to teach you to play guitar <laughs> and i thought okay all right you know i'm good you know so i he gives me that that blue lightning bolt you know that the his guitar you know the his ml the the dean you know yeah blue you, you know do you know what i'm talking about of course it, yeah yeah so anyway he gives me that and he sits down to teach me how to play johnny be good and we did that for maybe 10 minutes and he said oh fuck it <laughs> <laughs> I took it back he said oh, this is this is worthless <laughs> hopeless <laughs> Uh, but uh i you know i was i always i got better over time with him you know uh, i mean after a record or two you know i was able to keep up with him pretty well but right once you I understand did, the sort of like the specific language of someone's process creative process yeah yeah the brothers you know after a while especially with solos i would always let uh, Dimes brother Vinny um, re- record because Vinny is a good engineer. You know he would. You know uh, he needed me. We worked together really well. We complemented each other. But when it come to came to actually doing guitar solos, Vinny would do all the punch. He would actually sit with a tape machine and and I'd get the sound and everything set up and he would do all the punching in and actually recording of it because they would look at each other and and Vinny would go, Hey, do that Randy Rhodes part and Dime would know exactly what Vinny was talking about. You know, I couldn't do that. And, but also Vin do, is a drummer. And so he has a real rhythmic sense. And because he'd played with his brother for so long, they had this like intuitive connection, right? They just, they listened to the same music. They, I mean, they were always together. They, I mean, always together. So they, they knew exactly what each other were thinking before right. they even thought it, you know, they, it was just, a, it, th- that was a, the tightest brother connection I'd ever seen. Um, and, and it, so it, it would just, it just made a lot more sense toward, you know, after the first couple records, you know, I just slowly said, Vinny, I'm going to be right here on the, in the room. I'll be right here, but why don't you sit, you know, you guys do this. And, um, you know, then back then with tape, what we would do would be, um, we re- record three ch- three tracks of of leads, three separate leads, and then we'd go through and we'd comp the best parts of each one. You know, like we would do with vocals, only we'd do it with a with a lead guitar. And so, with with that kind of process, uh, Vinny and Dime just worked so much more efficiently together. So, did he write his solos, or were those improvised in the studio, or a little bit of both? probably a little bit of both yeah um i would say 
I would say they were mostly improvised. I, and I, I, I know the riffs were written for the most part beforehand. He'd come up with a few of them on the spot, but the main riffs of the songs he he would have written beforehand. Matter of fact, there's yeah. a great story again of we were doing far beyond the third record I did with them. And we were staying at a hotel in Nashville, big high rise holiday Inn or something. Um, and dime we were at the studio. He said he didn't like his room. So he called the hotel and told them, you know, to move his stuff to a different room or whatever. Well, he forgot when he packed his stuff up, he forgot to put this cassette or, or dat tape or a work tape that he had. He had 250 riffs on it. Oh shit. And it just got lost. It's like it gone, gone, never found it. So somebody somewhere has a tape of 250 dime bag riffs that he, <laughs> that he had written and was going to use on either this record or another one. And, I mean, it's it like no that movie to... about uh, when the uh, history got erased and that that guy r- uh, wrote all the Beatles songs and performed them and became a huge star. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh no, I hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good story, though. <laughs> uh, I wonder if those landed in anyone's hands and if they figured out what it was. I I don't know. Um, he never found them again. I know that because he oh. was he was kind of pissed off, but. The thing is, he just turned around and wrote 250 more, you know, right. and um, it was, you know, whatever. But didn't seem like any shortage of riffs coming out of that guy's uh, hand and, and out of his no. mind. No. And after the studio was done, you know, we'd finish whatever time of night. He'd go up to his little, he has a little closet at his house, practice place. He'd sit and have drinks with his buddies and they'd write a whole album at night after we were done in the studio. Just some stupid, right. you know, country record or some, you know, right, whatever, you know, just some silly record. As a matter of fact, um, that, uh, the I think the only song, did they win a Grammy? Nominated for a Grammy for one of their songs. And that song actually came out of that rehearsal spot. Um, and I mean, literally came out of it. it. He he brought this cassette down. It's a four track cassette. And he goes, I wrote this song I really like, and I'd like to re-record it for the record. It's called Suicide Note Part One. And uh, it was an acoustic guitar and maybe a couple of little things, but and I said, I listened to it. I said, no, we're not going to re-record that acoustic guitar. It sounds great. I said, let's just add to it. So I, I just took that right Dumped off the Dumped it cassette, onto the two inch? Put it onto the two inch and we added a few things onto it. Um, another guitar maybe. And uh, I can't remember what else, some keyboards or something, but very sparse still. But it, that basically the, the main song was literally dumped from a cassette from his closet the night oh, that's before crazy <laughs> yeah so whoa hmm. yeah that's insane so uh i mean when you met these guys and and made uh cowboys with them mm-hmm. at that point what would that was like what was was that 1990 89 90 uh that would have been 89ish yeah yeah. Okay. So uh, mm-hmm. up to that point, the, um, and that record, that record was, was a, was a big record for them, but the next record is the one that exploded for them. I, th- I think so. Yeah. Uh, the next two, I think right. uh, the, th- the third one that I did, I say third one, they had a few records before me, but third I had major that, label. I had that uh, the, in the jungle uh, in junior yeah, high school. Yeah, Metal Magic or something, yeah. Yeah. Um, those were not uh, major label. Re- the, yeah, right. the ones I, the, the ones, Cowboys was the first major label record. Where were we going with that one? Well, um, I was going to ask you, essentially I was going to kind of like cross-reference what you had done so far and compare it to what they had, what they were about to do and see sort of like what your expectation was of her. Or did you have any, did you have any idea of what was, what that band was going to be? Cause every, like 
you, every record you make, you're like, I don't know, could could uh, sounds good, feel good about it, but <laughs> who knows what the fuck it'll do, right? Like this yeah. one could sell a million, it could sell 150 copies. That's that's not up to any of us. And you had done like Metal Church, uh, well, Mother the, Love Bone, Soundgarden. Yeah, the uh, the the thing that got me uh, that got their attention was really the Soundgarden, uh, Soundgarden stuff. I think Phil, I was actually the second or third choice by for Pantera to do that record. Um, and uh, I wasn't available, so it's good. Good for you. Good for you. You weren't born yet. What are you talking about? Shit. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so I was second or third, and and I think the story kind of went that Phil was a real Soundgarden fan, um, and so he he liked what I had done probably with – I think it probably was louder than love at that time. I don't think I'd done Bad Motor Finger yet, but – um yeah, that's probably why I got that why I got the oh and you were asking I think the original question did I have any idea what was going to you know what was going to happen with them wh- whether it was they were going to turn into what they were right and the answer is not really um uh I mean we knew they were good their demo that I was I was sent their demo on cassette of cowboys and I could tell it was really good. Um, I had no idea how good they really were, even after a couple of records, you know, um, <laughs> I, I really didn't. I mean, it was like I was in the, I was in, doing so many records and it, you know, you get, for me, I get in into those things and we're all buddies. We're all just having you know, drinking beer and, and, you know, recording a record and woohoo, you know, isn't this fun? You don't really realize, uh, you know, that really th- this is going to stand the test of time. You know, you don't, I did, I couldn't tell. It was the same with Soundgarden, you know, I mean, we were doing the, doing those records and all having a great time. Nobody knew that, you know, those guys would, you know, that Chris would have, would have a voice that was, you know, would go down in history. Who, I mean, who would have figured in 19, that was what, 1988? Louder Than Love? Who would have figured, I mean, that this like weird, heavy, psychedelic Zeppelin meets Sabbath band would become one of the biggest bands in the world through the 90s? Just like... That's that's the whole thing, you know, you're doing, I you're doing those things and I mean grew up listening to that kind of, you know, I grew up listening to their influences, I right. guess, you know, and so you hear it and it's like, all right, this is really good. You know, this reminds me of stuff that I, you know, listened to when I was going to high school and, you know, this is what I really, but when I'm writing, there, there's no mystique getting back to the, the right. mystery. The, the mystique wasn't there because we, you know, I know every single t-shirt that every single band member owns, you know, by the time a record's done, I've, I've seen all their entire wardrobe at least once. So there's no mystique. Right. You also know, like, unfortunately for better or worse, you know, the inner dynamics of a band, you see the, you see the strengths and also, also the fragile side of the the real structure of a band because both of those things exist uh, in every interaction. Yes. Um, Yeah. I mean, every band has their dynamics as you know, (laughs) and that's a nice, nice word for it, but, (laughs) but uh, it's like a four or five way marriage. And, um, but, you know, those kind of things, I mean, I never even paid attention to them. You know, there'd be there'd be times when people argued, you know, you got four or five guys trying to, you know, create, you know, to paint the same picture. Right. It's like, you know, it's my turn with a brush. I don't like the color you're using, you know. Well, 
you know, fuck you. I wrote the, I, I drew the painting, you know? So, right. Um, I guess, uh, there's always guitars or vocals to comp while people go outside to fight or whatever. Uh, yeah. If they go outside <laughs> it's easy to fight, for you that's, to stay that's, out that's of really, con- that's, that's being considerate. You know, <laughs> usually I'm trying to mix something while they're fighting in the room. So yeah, right. You know, there's not that, you know, most of the, I've been lucky. Most of the bands I've worked with, uh, you know, other than the normal occasional disagreements. Yeah. Most, most people, um, most of the records are fun. And as people, uh, as we've all gotten older, we are a lot more uh, easy to negotiate our ideas into a, a greater concept. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the testosterone level drops and, and things become easier <laughs> yeah. to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now let me let me see if I remember this right. Are you from Idaho? No. Um, well, I'm not from Idaho, but I lived in Idaho for about uh, five four years. Okay, so I remember I, that you. I, lived I grew up there. in the Midwest. I was born in oh, uh, born in Michigan. Lived in Ohio, Indiana, my whole life. That's where you went to school. Uh, that's where I went to high, through high school, and then yeah. I moved to Idaho to go to college. To Boise State? Uh, no, Moscow in, in uh, U of I in Moscow. Okay, um, which is where I started recording. Actually, there was a local radio station. Uh, well, it was a the college student run station, and some friends were working up there. And there was a uh, a little four track Crown tape deck that was set up for doing remote recordings and. I just started taking that into the clubs and recording whoever came through. And, um, so you would just show up with a real, a four track reel machine mm -hmm. and would you get a feed off the sound board or would you, I had a little six channel Sony mixer, Uh (laughs) six, not eight, not 16, six for some reason. (laughs) Uh, and microphones that had batteries in them. And I would somehow, I would, let's see, I'd, I'd take uh, the vocal feed from the mixing board and then I would tape my microphones to the kick drum mic, the snare drum mic, the bass mic, and the guitar mics. And then I would take, and most of these clubs we were working in, the only thing coming through the PA was a vocal anyway. So, right. uh, so I was taking mainly that and, and Did, I would tell so you had guys, a separate snake as well that you were feeding. I must, off? I must have done something. I can't remember if I just had a bunch of mic cables that I stretched out. I, I don't remember. It was Did so, like someone went with you the first time you did this. Surely. Yeah. Um, and they were I think like, I figured a lot of it out on my own. Um, <laughs> I think. What, I, I think. Uh, I think somebody. Oh, I know what 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 it was. Um, let's see, that would have been mid seventies, and uh, my friends were all musicians, kind of hippies living in the hills up around Moscow, up you know whatever, and they yeah. all kind of playing you know hippie music and. Uh, Rolling Stone, the back cover of Rolling Stone. Uh, this would have been, like I said, 76-ish. Um, the back cover, TIAC was advertising uh, your own home studio. It was an eight-track tape deck with a two-track tape deck and a little board and some microphones for $10,000, I think it was. And one of the, guy- <laughs> <laughs> one of the guys... Um, uh, who lived there, who I, one of my friends who was playing said, you know, he was like, you can make your own records. You can, you can make your own record. That's amazing. You know, and this, that sort of, you know, not being a musician, just hanging out, feeling kind of dorky, you know, that kind of, that kind of lit me up a little bit going, well, this is how I could be one of the guys without being a dork, you know, without sitting there just with my, you know, mouth hanging open. And so that's how I found some equipment and I just um, 
You didn't put together 10 is... grand and buy that kit, did you? What's that? Did you put 10 grand together and buy one of those kits? No, 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 no. That's a um, lot of scratch in 1976. That, that was that was a lot, but but that made me start thinking, and that's how I found that four track at the radio station. And maybe I knew of the four track at the time. And when we saw that, that just, you know, I put two and two together, but, um, and, uh, yeah. So then I had to learn how to use it. And unfortunately this was before YouTube. So I couldn't go to YouTube and learn how to record. I had, Were there to, any salty had, old guys in town that knew, knew a thing or there, two? Yeah, there were, uh, the guy who was, at the radio station who was doing the live recordings before me, it was mainly coffee houses and open mics and that, you know, very simple stuff. Mm -hmm. He sort of gave me the basics. And then, uh, and then I must, I learned on my own somehow, you know, I, I would talk to people. I would just get, you know, people would show me things along the way. And, um, uh, do you, do you remember a guy named Paul Spear? I don't know. From Seattle. Uh, 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 he's a guitar player that did, um, oh, uh, sort of, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, I think he had one record called Natural States. It was, it's that, you know, kind of vibe music, just sort of calming music, I guess. What, yeah. what, there's a name for that. I can't think of it. Anyway, ambient? he was. He did ambient music? Not ambient, but, um, uh, it's like meditation music almost, you know, but it's Got with it. it. He played electric guitar. It's, it's, uh, anyway, um, he was, so he taught me a lot. He really kind of gave me, uh, uh, some, some really good tips back, back then. He was sort of traveling with a band and producing them on the road, mm -hmm. um, a, a local kind of club circuit band. And then he moved to Seattle and uh, uh, started working. He did, did a record with the Cowboys. Remember the Cowboys from Seattle back? The I Heats. That, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know the Heats. Yeah. So the Cowboys and the Heats were sort of the the band, you know, the big club bands in Seattle back in uh, would have been 80, early 80s. Right. Uh, so he was working with them and he, he would include me, brought me along and um, showed me a bunch of stuff. So that's kind of, uh, he, that's where I picked up a lot of that stuff. So, yeah, you know, just learned on a seat of my pants. So how long did you do? I mean, how many live shows do you think you recorded for the college radio station? And, um, how long did you do it? Like, well, I was there I was only there four years and I probably did it for maybe a year and a half, two years. I don't know how many, but, uh, between Moscow and Pullman, uh, I would, you know, there were two clubs mainly there that I would go down and work out of the one in Pullman would have the bigger bands, the, the more national, uh, flying burrito brothers. I, I talked them into letting me record them back really? then. Really? <laughs> Do you still have the tapes? Said, you know, I hope I, I don't know if I do or not. There, there's, I got a room over here. Yeah. Not, it's not even a room. It's sort of like a storage space that has so much stuff that I'll never in my lifetime go, you know, like go through tape, tapes that, that were running through all those records that I did just like lot, you know, tapes that I would constantly leave running to capture a, a riff if somebody had, it. Right. And there's hours and hours and hours. And I'm sure there's some stuff in there that dates all the way back would be worth worthwhile. And yeah, there, there probably is a tape or two from that. That's amazing. So the flying Flag burrito brothers, that's so great. Is there anyone else that, folks would be surprised to hear that was coming through Pullman that you recorded? Um, probably, but those are the one, that's the one that sticks out in my head. Um, Vassar Clements was another one, uh, not as popular, but he was a older fiddle player that played on probably, probably played with the Flying Burrito Brothers, probably played with 
Allman Brothers. You know, right. he was kind of the fiddle player in those days. So that's crazy. Um, but yeah, there's oh George Thorogood. I think oh no 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 I didn't I didn't get him. I traded something. <laughs> some of the stuff that I was doing, some of the local Idaho stuff with another college radio station that was doing a similar thing back East. And they, they, they gave me a live George Thorogood recording that they did. And I gave them, I don't know, Howling Wolf or something. You, know, you or fucking a, recorded Howling Wolf? No, 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 no. Oh, gotcha. That, that, yeah, that's not the blues guy. It, it's a, uh, wait a minute. Oh, did I say Howling Wolf? I meant Howling Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not Howling Wolf. Um, maybe it was Howling Coyote, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Blind Lemon Pledge. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> mm, anyway. Uh, uh, what a crazy way to get into recording, I think. So leading up to that point, you were you were hanging out with these hippies, and that was that was like... People were picking on acoustic guitars around a campfire and singing Friend of the Devil. I mean. Um, yeah, I don't even remember what they were singing. What, what Jim, they were singing. Jim Croce more, folk songs? Not so much around the campfire. It was more like a shitty old house up in the hills outside of Idaho with no heat. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and yeah, they were and just sitting around playing guitars there but yeah, so needless um, to say if you were if if you're driving around and you're not listening do i remember this right you listen to sports radio when you drive do i have um, that right I, I, yeah i tend to listen to talk radio of some kind rather than music when i'm now that's changing a little it depends on how if how busy i am if if i've been working non-stop up here I don't want to listen to music for a while. So I'm listening to anything but music. I don't blame you. So when you listen to music, what are you listening to? Are you listening to Neil, like Neil Young or? I love, yeah, I love older stuff like that. Um, old blues, I think is my, is like my favorite. If I don't want to think too much, if I just want to feel um, old blues, but um, I definitely do like, going back to you know earlier times for me you know i do like old neil young and um do you think that it's do you feel like it's ironic that as a fan of just like really because all that music is really sparsely recorded it's like uh, like there's just like throw some mics up and like when you, if it gets mixed at all uh yeah. it's there's nothing on it and yeah, but you are like one of the most in demand guys for like super aggressive, <laughs> like gnarly sounding records. Yeah, I don't I don't have any idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue. Um, I the only thing I can say is, you know, I I I did my some of the early records that I did that started that got popular that got some attention were records that were like that, like metal church, you know, that was right. the first record I did that kind of broke out of Seattle a little bit. And it was the um, first record. Yes. It was their first record. Yeah. I yeah. wore three copies of that out. Ah, so still one of my favorite records. I mean, the first two songs on that record are still my first, my favorite first two songs on any record I've ever done. And it was, it was, it's two songs that were blend that kind of crossfade into each other. Yeah. Which was incredibly hard to do in those days when you're working with tape, you know, right. cause I had to record them separately then try to edit them. So it sounds like they're crossfading into each other. Um, and anyway, now you could do it. Now anyone could do that lickety split. I know. Back yeah, then as a, there's a real art. I know. Uh, used to be, you know, a fade out used to be a real art back then, you know, just fading a song out. Right. Now it's like, oh, what is, let me look at that curve on, on TV and, and, and see what I'll it looks like. I'll just drag it down over the course of seven seconds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I even, I mean, even when SSLs came out and they had the auto fade function on uh, in the, you know, 
where you could, you know, press a button and set a set a dial for how long you wanted the fade to go, and it would do it automatically. Even that used to bum me out when they started that because, you know, fading a song was like depending on how many, you know, joints you'd smoked was right. really really the <laughs> funnest part of the mix. You know. <laughs> Uh, how did you, how did you come to work on that metal church album? How did that, how did that come about this hippie guy from Idaho? <laughs> well, um, I, you know, I, I would, was working in, uh, at a place called Steve Lawson productions, which became bad animals down the road. And, uh, back in those days in Seattle, all the studios had, uh, a house engineer or two. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to make a record in Seattle, you would, you wouldn't pick the studio for the studio. You would pick the studio for the engineer that was there. So it was more of a personality thing than a, than a technical thing or a vibe thing um, for the most part. And those guys, you know, they came to me and um, um, we got along. I'm trying to think the specifics because there was a, um uh, there were a couple guys the the money guys um uh, uh, jeff gilbert do you know jeff gilbert sure legend seattle legend yes jeff and his buddy willie forget willie's last name now but um they put out a uh a, a sampler record uh and, and the Northwest name of still have metal fest Yes, Northwest Metal Fest. And so um, Metal Church was one of the bands on there. They put they put the record out and they um, were waiting to see which artist got the most response on that. And as Metal Church got the most response. And um, uh, so they decided to put their money into a full album for that band. Um think i don't remember you know if i if they just happened to come by and i don't remember um exactly why they came to me but they decided to do it with me and <clears throat> i said look i've never done heavy, a heavy metal record before you know i said i i'll i can do it you know i but i need i need you to for, for our next meeting, which was, I believe, up at Easy Street Records, I think Willie might have been an early owner of Easy Street up in, I think it was in West Seattle. Yeah. But anyway, um, I said we're gonna, we were going to have a meeting there uh, and kind of figure stuff out. And I said, so you guys just bring me, you know, everybody bring me a couple records of your influences so I know where you're coming from. And they brought me basically the Ramones and Black Sabbath. <laughs> right. And I said, Oh, that's heavy metal. Okay. I know now I know what, I know where we're going now. <laughs> you know? Right. So, um, so it became easy and we did that record, that metal church record. I think we did it. Oh, I want to say it cost $5,000 and we did the whole thing in two weeks. Wow. Uh, uh, two. Yeah. I think it was two weeks. I mean, I, I could be a week off in there somewhere, but it was roughly in that time zone. And Recorded, the thing went on to sell a quarter mil it it sold a quarter of a million copies, you know, right. on the East Coast alone and got signed to Epic, you know, with no no money down, basically. So uh did they were they one of the bands that went to uh Metal Blade first? I don't think so. No, uh I, I don't think so. I I know Jeff and Willie uh, paid for that, um, yeah. you know, and I and I think Epic, I know Epic signed them, um, was the first major signing. I don't think they did Metal Blade, but again, I could be forgetting things. It's been a few years. That's so. great. Um, but uh, That's yeah, that was that was fun. That was a fun one. And so basically just based on that experience and its popularity, heavy bands just kept coming to you? Uh, yes. I was 
actually that was the first record that I got a production credit on. Um, the guys were, I was hired as an engineer and the guys were really happy with what I did. So as a thank you, they, the credits said produced by, um, um, Kurt Vanderhoof, mm -hmm. metal church and me. So I got a third, I, you know, and so the record started doing really well on the, like I said, on the East coast <clears throat> and, uh, the guys, uh, the bands couldn't hire metal church to produce them or Kurt Vanderhoof cause he was busy. Uh, and so they called me, you know, and so I started getting some calls on the East coast and that's when I went freelance as a producer at that and that was would have been like 86 ish and you've been doing that for that long like 34 years yeah well i i started i, I became freelance producer in the late 80s so however many years i i can't even count that high anymore so <laughs> do, do you remember so there there i mean there's probably so many records that you have worked on that that didn't gain that kind of popularity because not that many records sell as even back then. Right. Right. By major label standards, a quarter of a million is like, okay, well, I guess we'll give them another record and see what happens. Well, back then quarter of a million records was a big deal. I mean, even back then, even a, a gold record was a huge, was a major accomplishment. Well, especially so, if it only cost $5,000. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> It, it was during those days, if you sold $200,000, uh, 200,000 records on your first record, you were in the game. You were big time in the game. That was like, if, if you uh, saw that many now you're uh, number one on the chart. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. You're the but Rolling back then, Stones. <laughs> back, back then it used to be, you know, if you sold that many records on your first record, you pre pretty much could guarantee the next record would sell three times as much because for every person that bought it, two people would make a cassette of it, you know, and right. would copy it. And so there was really three times as many pieces of product out there and the next record comes out. It's not a, it's not a risk for people. So they, they'd already enjoyed the first one. So um, it seemed like every record would triple. So, uh, I was a huge uh, mother Lo and remain a mother love bone fan as well. Um, I, I can't remember. Did you work on the, you didn't work on the EP. Is that correct? You were, you've made the record. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yes. Um, Mark Dern, I think it was Mark Dernley did the EP, I believe. Uh, that's, it remains like probably my favorite record. I mean, it's funny you made, you recorded three records that were three of my most listened to records through high school, which is amazing. <laughs> it's incredible. Well, you know, my the timing at, we've yeah. talked about too, a mother love bone and metal church. That was a really good time musically in Seattle. Yeah. You know, and I don't know what the third the third one record was, but uh, Soundgarden. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, that was just like a magic time in Seattle. Yeah, and I was my timing was good. I was right there, you know, ready to go when when things started happening. So, at what point um, did you were you able to stop eating ramen? Because <laughs> you're working on ma at this point, uh, you know, by the late '80s, you're working on major label records or at least budgeted um, indie label records, and it's you know, you and I know there's not a ton of money in it, but there's you're getting you at least you make money. It's not like hey, can you do us a favor, man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, I I was pretty lucky on that side too. I when I first moved to Seattle, I was doing live sound for a few years with, uh, uh, with the Cowboys actually. And, um, so I was moving black boxes from club to club basically. 
every night and living in a house on Queen Anne with six other guys. And I think we made <laughs> 25 bucks a week, maybe if we we're lucky. <clears throat> and once that was, once I, once I got into the studio, into Steve Lawson, which was 81, 82, I think. Um, I, I told Steve that, um, he closed his doors at, uh, you know, he, he, he was doing commercials, commercial music, uh, mm -hmm. commercial ads, you know, for TV. So he was working nine to five. And so this great 24 track studio, you know, pretty much state of the art at that time was closed from five o'clock at night until eight o'clock in the morning the next day. And I said, just in, and once again, Paul Spear was the one that instant that helped me out with this, but uh, we went down and talked to Steve and I said, you know, this is, those are the hours when you're closed during the hours when we want to work, you know, that's the, right. the nighttime is when we want to work. I said, why, you know, let's charge 50 bucks an hour for the studio. You pay me 10 bucks an hour. And, uh, and then I'll just bring, I'll bring business in, you know, I'll bring people in from the clubs who I know. And uh, he said, are you going to steal my microphones? And I said, no, probably not. And <laughs> he goes, okay. Uh, and so, so he gave me, you know, he, he put me in and I just went, I went down, you know, my friends down in, in the clubs. I said, Hey, I got a studio to work out of. Let's go record, you know? And, um, you know, we, we just, we had, we, all those bands at that time, we just, we got busy really, really fast. And, um, so I was, you know, it was, I was, it was an hourly thing. I wasn't making tons of money, but my, um, uh, 10 bucks an hour was a lot more back then. It was a lot more like back a lot then. More. And Minimum I was wage used to was 25 $2. bucks a week. I was used to 25 bucks a week. Yeah. So, you know, actually making a few hundred bucks a week, I, I was living high on the hog. I was fine. 1981 minimum wage, I think was about, was but two twenty five or $2. Probably. Yeah, yeah, probably. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it was definitely fine. And I mean, I, I worked as much as I wanted to, uh, you know, which, which was 80 hours a week. Probably. I was just, I was, wow. I probably only build the studio for probably 40 hours a week, but right. we worked a lot. So, um, and out of that came, you know, those, uh, metal church and sir mix a lot, you know, that was during that time too. Um, Did you work on sir mix a lot's record? Oh, I you did, did the metal church I, one, the Iron Man thing? I did that one, yeah. Oh, I did that. <laughs> and I also did I did uh, everything w with him up through Swass, his first LP. Right. Um, and uh, now he would record all this stuff on his, the first like uh, uh, Square Dance Rap. Uh, yeah. That Butter was all biscuits. four track cassette. Um, and, uh, all that kind of stuff, but he, he, he would record it on a four track cassette or he had an eight track open reel Fostex and he would mainly bring it in to me for mixing and we would do some vocals. Um, but most of the stuff he did at home, but he brought, brought it partway finished to me and then we would finish it and mix it. But yeah, that was, uh, that's really how. Iron Man came about is uh, he wanted, you know, Mix wanted to get that metal church heaviness into his stuff. He goes, I want to do Iron Man. I want to do it with that sound behind me. And I want to come out on stage with these big Gore-Tex boots. He made right. a big deal about Gore-Tex boots. I'm going, the fuck? What? what? Gore-Tex boots? What? Right. You need waterproof boots what, for this? Well, I don't get it, you know? <laughs> well, we would la we'd laugh about that. I still, you know, every maybe every year or two, I hear from him or we run into each other somewhere, you know. So, um, that's amazing. He did a lot of stuff. He he was playing Pullman 
uh, four or five years ago. And my daughter was going to school over there and she, she goes, Hey, Sir Mix-a-Lot's playing. Can you get me in? I go, yeah. call him. <laughs> and I said, Hey Mix, can you get, you know, my daughter and some of her friends in? He goes, yeah. So got her in first row, all that, you know, yeah. gave her the treatment. And then when he went to do baby got back, he calls them all up on stage <laughs> while he does baby got back. And I, <laughs> I had to call him after that. And I said, Mix, come on, now. <laughs> come, come on, on my daughter you know <laughs> <laughs> this is uh this is how uh you repay him <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh I, I mean i i'm sure that she had a great time but you had to like you're like whoa oh she oh she had a yeah, yeah. They, they had she a thought blast. it was the best yeah they were like they were instantly famous at wazoo <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible yeah. Uh wow. Uh what year was that? Do you remember what year Iron Man was? I'm trying to put it in context of it was it, it, I want to say 87. That would be my guess. Yeah. Um I was actually kind of on Wikipedia or something the other day and I was, like, I was trying to remember something that I had done and so I, I better go to Wik- maybe Wikipedia has it. And it had a pretty good <laughs> discography but the years seemed all wrong to me, you know, but uh, it did have a Sir Mix-a-Lot listed as 1988, but I don't know if it was Iron Man. I'm pretty sure I did the other Sir Mix-a-Lot stuff. Well, those, 19, you know, Wikipedia we, will will show you what when the release was, but you know, you uh, were working you were working on the Deftones record last year, and it just you know it's it's not even out yet. Can you see? look at all these records? Wait a minute. Look at all Let me these. Can, uh, where am I? Uh, where's the loaded uh, platinum record? Oh, um, I'm not sure. Look around. It must it be. It might have got lost <laughs> in the mail. I think it got lost in the mail. I'm trying to trying to see what. Oh, there it is. I got to do. Okay. Four times platinum. Well, that one, the big one, is like not an official one. That was one that he gave out to. Uh, six people who helped him with with all the early records. Those are all singles. Now the the wow. gold one right there, that's the Swass right gold record. That's that basically. Wait a minute. Did you work on you worked on Swass? I did. Well, Swass was basically all these ones, all these singles that we had done right up until that point. Let me uh, ask you this. Yeah. This is something that I have been wondering about for some time. Okay. What about that Pussycat Dolls song? Pussycat Dolls song. You don't know about this? Uh-uh. You might be due some money, TD. Why what what uh what I mean maybe about? I don't know. I don't know if they actually sampled it and if you have any points on the sound recording oh no i wouldn't have i don't have any points on sir mix a lot stuff we i did all that stuff for 10 bucks an hour and That's incredible because uh, w- <laughs> that was pre- that was pre-metal church and and that was be- when i was engineering only right and well, plus it, the accolades it, what, of a gold record what's that plus the accolades of a gold record <laughs> yeah well yeah i mean i was never i was never one to like go back after the fact and say hey man Right. You know, I agreed to this, but now you sold this, so you owe me, you know. Sure, like, an agreement nah, is an no, agreement. Right? No, I made a deal. We made a deal. I was happy. So what I did was when it sold a million copies, their um the manager, um Ed Locke was his name. Um, Gary Locke's nephew, I think. Huh. The governor's nephew. Anyway, yeah. um I said to him, um, uh, we uh gail and i were getting married around that time and um ed had um like a dj system that he would rent out to parties or whatever so i just got him to come out and do the music for our wedding for free so that That's was nice. the payback that stuff ain't well, cheap no and it was more of like more funny than anything else it was more like <laughs> all right man you owe me come place you can do some music here it, it was and he was happy to do it it was it we were all it was all fun back then 
do so. uh do people still work i mean do companies record companies still operate with points on records yeah. with producers yeah oh yeah. yeah how many points did you get on my record on your record yeah what do you get Five? um three I have no idea. I think I had all your points. What's I the? Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was ten nil. <laughs> yeah. No, I think. I mean, typically, you know, it was. I don't want to talk about money, but it was. You know, it's typically it's three, four points somewhere in there. Yeah. How'd that work out on the loaded record for you? <laughs> Just um, kidding. Um, <laughs> money's not important to me. It's the yeah. art that's important. <laughs> I'm just, I'm mostly trying to make fun of myself. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, that was, uh, that was, a. Uh, I met some very fun people besides you doing that record. So yeah, of course. Uh, I, I still talked to Isaac just texted me the other day, actually. So um, I'm recently in touch with Isaac because we are working on a Couchress video. A what now? Couch riffs. We're working on a couch riffs video. So oh, I'm, couch riffs. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I do. Uh, I make these videos also, right? Well, I know we talked about that the other, you know, couple weeks ago, and the artist in question never got back to me. He's probably nervous. Well, sometimes it takes a while. Sure. And, and then, it, then I hear back. But um, I had another person reaching out to him too. He got crickets as well. Yeah. Well, I, um, I'm going to get him. I, I'm going to get him. I called him the other, I called, I texted him the other day and, and, uh, he's, he finally got back to me saying he's doing some interviews this afternoon. So, uh, but I, 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 I didn't, didn't, I got a few, a few crickets also, but, um, didn't even we, occur it, to typical. me that I gave uh, him some crickets too. So right after, right before that, so it didn't all, occur to me that crickets. they that this person had a, a, a release sometime in the future, and so I was like, oh right, right, maybe a great time because it. Uh, I'm making some pretty great, like pretty good videos. They're getting some traction. Still getting traction. I put one out a few weeks ago and still uh, getting shared by some online magazines and getting high ratings and yeah, uh, amongst all the quarantine videos that are being made. But anyway, <laughs> uh, whatever. Yeah. It's a it's just a fun thing to do. Hopefully, yeah. speaking of it being fun, right? I just like I kind of feel like at a time in the history of society we're constantly being pummeled with bad news mm -hmm. you know you can't turn on any form of community like whether it's the radio or you open your phone and you know you're getting alerts or turn on a tv or your computer and pop-ups and you're getting and you know, no one's like hey you know like the day and age of cat videos is dead that era, <laughs> we are past it, right? We're not like seeing kitties <laughs> wrestle with bunnies, man. We're just seeing mm. like people being mistreated and uh, everyone is mad. And yeah, you uh, can't keep people cooped up this long without something going wrong, you know? Right. Yeah. But uh, I just hope that, you know, trying to do something that make people smile. Well, that's what the world needs now is a little bit more smiling. I think so, Titi. I think so, buddy. <laughs> See, I, I told you so. I was a hippie up in Idaho. For it's true. <laughs> what do you when you're not making records or working on mixes or I mean, I imagine you get a lot of folks. You still have a manager? Yes. So yeah. people hit hit your management up and they're like, "Hey, we're a heavy metal band from." Denmark and we're big fans of TD and we want him to mix our single or our record. You get a, a, probably a lot of stuff like this. Uh, yeah, I get not, you know, not a, not a ton. Cause I don't actively go after it right now. Cause I've spent so 30 some years sitting in a little dark room 
you know, that I kind of enjoy the sunlight now. So I do <laughs> other things outside, <clears throat> but, um, you know, I probably get two to maybe, maybe two a week, uh, yeah. requests to mix things, you know, from, and those come from, to me directly, most, most of them, uh, just people get a hold of my, uh, email address and send me stuff. And some of them I do, some of them I don't. Right. Is that based on whatever demos they send you or just your timing and mood or what's going on in your life or whether that, you have a that, fishing trip planned or? Yeah, pretty much. It's all, it's all that. I mean, if something came through that was undeniably amazing, I would probably make some time for it. Um, like if I was like, Hey Terry, I'm making a solo record. You'd be like, Oh if, man, if that would, that would absolutely <laughs> happen by the way. Um, and no joke, all joking aside or no joking at all, but yeah, yeah. I'm saying it here out into the world on your podcast. <laughs> yes. If you sent me something, I would help out. And if I could help out it, and, and I try my best not to ruin your band. <laughs> so anyway um yeah so i you know i go through these phases where i'm working non-stop and when i'm done with those phases i don't i want to not work non-stop you know i want to do anything but work and so i'll do that until i get bored with it and then i'll with it you know fortunately with any luck i'll have something else to go back in to do right um so so what yeah. when you're not working on records are you like are you fishing used to um i don't as much as i'd like to um fishing seems to be more of a commitment than it used to be you know it would take a lot more time right now what i, I go out, i play a lot of golf you know because it's a good it's a four-hour commitment right i can go like get get through you know get i get a nice walk in you know, get some exercise, get some sun. Um, how do you do out there? How do I do? Yeah. Are you, are you any good? I'm getting better. I mean, you never, golf is a game that you're never any good at. Um, cause you can't shoot zero, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm getting the the more I play, the better I can I get, and uh, I I've, I've been playing a lot more lately. So, um, you know, I I started playing when I was working with Pantera during the day um, because we didn't start working till night usually, and um, the guys who did like to get up in the daytime, we uh, Vinny the drummer, Rex the bass player. Uh, some of the crew guys, um, we would pretty much go out and play every day. And um, uh, I had quit years ago. I played a little bit when I was in high school, but not, you know, it was never any good. And I quit because I'd just get so mad. I get angry at myself. I, I wouldn't enjoy the game because I sucked and I'd get mad. And so I quit. And when I started up again with those guys, I told myself, I'm only going to do this if you can ha just have fun. It doesn't matter. The results don't matter. You're just going to have fun doing it. And that's pretty much carried on. Once I got to that point, then I, I pretty much played from then until now whenever I could, whenever I had time. It's crazy for me to imagine you being mad. You, have, you seem like such a patient guy. You should talk to my daughters. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, I know that it is a game of patience. It is. And, uh, and that's why I like it so much because you're playing against yourself is really, you know, it's all a head game. It's like how you're controlling your thoughts. And, um, and that's, that's really the, that's, that's why I like it. It's just, you know, it's, it's you against yourself. You're playing against yourself and it's so schizophrenic. So. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine uh, golfing with Pantera. Oh yes, you can. 
Um, I mean, it, that doesn't okay, seem uh, here, like the most an, calming it, and zen uh, oh, here, time out on. Here, here's the example. All right, you're on the tee box. You hit your your drive into the woods left. Vinny, the drummer. Vinny starts singing "Welcome to the Jungle" for the next twenty minutes. <laughs> you know, until you hit until you hit your next shot. You know, it's just full voice "Welcome to the Jungle." Then he gets in his golf cart. And he drives through the sand trap so he can catch the lip on the other side of it catch with the air. golf cart and right. get some air. Uh, oh, and here's the other one. Um, one of the <laughs> members of the band, uh, we're on the second hole of the golf course, and the and the girl comes by with the with you know the cart the beverage cart. Yeah. Can I help you with anything? This particular band member said yes. How much for the whole cart? <laughs> Bought everything on the cart. Yeah. Every single bit of booze on the cart went into our our carts. <laughs> By the end of that round of golf, you know, you're standing over your putt on the 18th hole and it's just like the wind's blowing. 90 right. miles an hour because you're trying to stand straight over that over your like, thing. Quit moving the hole. <laughs> <laughs> Which hole do I aim for? That's um, right. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, uh, Pantera and golf, it's like the most juxtapositioned, two of the most juxtapositioned things ever. Golf and Pantera just don't seem to, you know. And we had we had golf shirts made up. <laughs> and I still have one of them, I believe, really? to this day. But it, they were great. It had it was a golf shirt and it had the little logo on the on the chest, and it said "Vulgar Display of Golf." <laughs> I can imagine that. Actually, so, that that sounds right. Yeah, that sounds uh, precisely correct. Yeah. So those are, that's where the golfing kind of. I actually played golf, I believe, with Metal Church one time too. I think I have a picture of me on the golf course with. Uh, their producer of the second record, who I worked with also, right, and the band playing golf. I think West Seattle, out of West Seattle, I think. I used to live overlooking that golf course. Yeah, was well, I got pictures of those guys. Yeah, I, I, I know. I just saw them the other day. I got pictures of them playing golf. So. Uh, a dime was a legendary, funny man. Yes, there's a. I feel like you told me a story once. I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you a story. And then if you don't mind, maybe mm. you could one up me and tell me the story that I'm hoping you'll tell here. But my, <laughs> um, my friend Jamie in Portland, he didn't know who Dime was. You know, he wasn't a Pantera fan, but he met him maybe at a escape shop or something like he worked. He met him somewhere. He lived in mm. Wisconsin. I want to say mm -hmm. Minnesota. He lived in Minnesota and, and uh dime was like, Hey man, what are you doing? Like you seem cool or whatever. You want to hang out today and <laughs> drive me around to some guitar shops, I think is what they did. Probably, and Jamie yeah. was like, yeah, let's do it. And so they just drove around and I think I'm probably fucking the story up, but dime just like bought a ton of guitars at pawn shops filled up the back and then they were driving down the road and Jamie, I think had just, maybe he had just bought this car or, you know, it was just like, it was everything he had, you know, he's like a 20 year old kid or whatever. Um, I think dime said, Hey, how much did this car cost you? <laughs> and he said, well, like 12, 1200 bucks, you know? And he goes, Man, I'll give you fifteen hundred bucks if you just like drive it into the lake, <laughs> like jump it into the lake. Let's jump your car into the lake, and I'll just pay for it. And he was like, "No, man, I can't. Like, I can't not have a car tomorrow. You know, I can't. I can't. Like, that sounds fun, but I can't do it." But he was the kind of guy that would do some shit like that all the time, oh. right? Uh, totally. I mean, like he would uh, burn a mountain of money if it seemed like a, a fun thing to do. Uh, you've probably heard the story of, uh, I think it's actually, there's actually a, a video of this, but um, I wasn't, I don't think, I don't think, 
was I there for this? I don't know if it's just so, so familiar. I can't remember if I was there or not, but anyway, um, I don't think I was there. It was damage plan. So their singer, um, it, damage plan had just started and their singer came over to dimes house. He just bought a brand new Ford F one fifty, Right. And, uh, came over to show it to dime and dime said, that's fucking beautiful. He said, and then one of dimes buddies, a guy named outlaw, you know, who used to be a race yeah. car driver. Right. And, uh, so dime goes, that's really pretty. And can hey, outlaw wanted to test it out. Do you mind if he drives it? <laughs> and so singer said, you know, knew what was coming, but he said, yeah, okay. So out in front of Dime's house is like a circular driveway. And then the middle is just grass. There's not, no trees or anything. And it's pretty big. So outlaw grabs this thing and immediately just starts burning rubber all the way around, just spins the tires all the way around that circular driveway until the until the tires completely shred off of the thing and then he hops the curb into the grass in the middle and keeps doing it on the rims <laughs> just tearing up the entire grass section in front of the house until the tires are completely gone and then dime walked over and gave the singer like fifteen thousand dollars or whatever the hell the car what you know he just bought the a brand new right ford and so dime just bought the truck from him and then he took, <laughs> then he took the the rims that were destroyed, took them off the car, and he had them mounted. The rims are like on the wall of his house, of Dime's house. They're probably still there. That's incredible. Did you tell I me a story know. about Cantrell's truck too? Uh, no, I don't think so. I swear, someone told me a story while we were making the record that Jerry. I think maybe he was living in Oklahoma and he at the time and he drove down and like instead of long term parking, he left his truck at Dime's house, which is a mistake. Oh, yeah, I think it's when, he, possible. when he came back, they had they had mounted like every single stupid thing that you could put on a truck, you know, like a light bar with a hundred lights and you know, uh, it was like <laughs> giant mirrors and w wheel flares. And, uh, basically it wasn't, it was not the same truck at all. That had is completely believable. Um, I, this started from earliest with the early, I, I don't know if it was cowboys or vulgar, but I had rented a car when I was down there and Vinny asked to borrow it, you know, okay. They're gone forever. Comes back and the whole thing, there's like, it's like a wheat field underneath the thing. You take the thing <laughs> and dri driven through all the fields of Texas. So everything, <laughs> uh, it, it just looked like a big grass thing there. Yeah. So that was, that was like the beginnings of things, you know, another time, uh, uh, we were working on uh, Great Southern Tread and Kill and working out of Dime's studio at his house. He lived he lived there, but the studio was a separate building. <clears throat> um, we'd always start around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And so I, I was at the studio, whatever. Dime wasn't there, didn't show up, wasn't there. No big deal. But um, I get this phone call finally, and he goes, hey, uh, can you run up to my house? and go to the fax machine okay the fax machine. <laughs> this is date, and, dates the uh, story <laughs> so right next to the fax machine there's some paperwork can you fax it to this number and then i'll see you in an hour um fine you know whatever um <laughs> so an hour he drives up fucking brand new cadillac the biggest cadillac you can buy right and the, the, they were insurance papers that I'd sent to him. He woke up in the morning, decided he wanted to get a new Cadillac, but he doesn't just get the Cadillac before he buys it. And he makes them, the dealership mount some Texas longhorns on the grill wrapped in Coors lights, cans, Coors light cans. And 
and then comes driving down down with that. And he'd already taken that thing and he found the button in the glove box that uh does something to the suspension so you can, you know, so you can drive it more aggressively or whatever. It can yeah. spin the tires with it. Anyway, that was just like to, that was a typical dime bag day, you know, wake up and buy a brand new Cadillac, put some Texas Longhorns on it, wrap it in Coors Light cans and start start work. <laughs> uh, I can appreciate, you know, a lot of folks uh, become successful and throw money at problems. I can really appreciate and problems will come at you like the more successful you get, whether you want them or not. Uh, but I can appreciate someone that will throw money at fun. Oh, just for this, for the sake of it. Constant cons. I mean, nonstop fun. Uh, uh, I went to, I saw him uh, backstage at this Seattle center one time. Um, or the, I guess it was the Coliseum. Anyway, it was, uh, the, ba- the, uh, the bathroom back there, huge bathroom, all tile, big room with nothing much in it. But at the end was this one little sink, little laboratory, you know, standard <laughs> yeah. old school, you know, two faucets, just a little sink. Right. Yeah. Well, they were in there when I came back with a ping pong ball and a nine iron. <laughs> and they were betting, they had a hundred, hundred dollar bills out there and they were betting hundred dollars on anybody who could chip a ping pong ball across the whole room and land it in a sink. And, and like, and stick it. And stick it. And Did of anyone course it's do a it? ping pong ball and it's porcelain. Very bouncy. It's not going to happen. Right. So <laughs> I came in, they gave me the nine iron. And they're all, you know, Rex and Dime, they're all, they can't do it. You know, they haven't been able to do it. I got in and I just got totally blind ass lucky. It sort of went in, hit the back and and went, you know, front to back and first stayed shot? in. Huh? First, first shot. shot. Just stayed in and they just lost it. They were stuffing hundred dollar bills into my shirt after I did. <laughs> you didn't <laughs> you even know? have to jump but out of anything, a cake. <laughs> uh, any, anything, anything to bet on fun you know it's just you know i can't tell you how many people how much hot sauce was was downed <laughs> because of dying you know uh their security guy big val um it was his birthday somebody brought this huge birthday cake out dime throws 200 bucks down and says 200 bucks if you eat the whole thing right now and so mm-hmm. he ate the entire cake. I mean, it was a huge birthday cake. <laughs> That's talk about diarrhea city. Oh my God. It was just non, nonstop. That's uh yeah. he's a one of a kind fella. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of, that's kind of why I, I, I couldn't after reinventing the steel light, I told him I, I can't, I got to stop. This is just, this is killing me. It's way too much fun. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't keep up with you guys anymore. Well, I imagine every, every thing, like everything winds up the next thing, right? It's like, well, we got to one up the last thing. It, and it was just, it was never one, one upping. It was just maintain. It was just, once it hit a level, it stayed there, you know? <laughs> and it was, a. It, it was not so much quality. It was quantity at, at some point. And it was just nonstop, but it was, Oh my God, are there stories? Right. I can't even remember them all. Uh, and but it's probably good. Probably good. Yeah. That's <laughs> probably, probably a defense mechanism of some kind. <laughs> uh do you ever i mean do you see yourself retiring or are you the kind of person that feels like you'll retire when you're when you're gone i I, well i think i think i will be retired probably i still enjoy the work i mean uh i don't enjoy the 12 hour days six days a week like i used to but uh, I can't, you know, I can't focus and concentrate for those many hours anymore, but I sure, I still enjoy battling a mix, trying to find the sound, you know, 
trying to do something new and different. Um, I enjoy that. And as long as I enjoy it and someone's going to hire me, I'll keep doing it. But it's probably going to be one of those things where just like, you know, at some point, and maybe it was yesterday, um, some, they're just going to say, I'm not that interested anymore. So. <laughs> I doubt it. I don't think <laughs> well, so. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, I think I'll just, I'll probably just slowly fade away, you know, but I, as long as I can still hear relatively well, and I, as, as long as I feel like I'm doing something that that's, that I'm satisfied with, I'll keep doing it. Uh, hearing and hearing loss is something that's come up in the last few uh, conversations I've had here. Because mm-hmm. I had, do you know who Paul Gilbert is? Yes. I had Paul Gilbert on the show a couple episodes ago, and he's he's had a, a lot of hearing loss. Like he's mm-hmm. like, his high end is gone. Yeah. And he, I think he wears hearing aids. Right. And... Uh, have you had any hearing loss from? Uh, you know, I'm sure I, I have, but the thing is, is first of all, I don't stand in front of a guitar amp. Right. Or to make cymbals, my living, most or importantly. Or drums. Yeah. Um, I can relative, I can pretty much control my, my uh, volume. And <clears throat> really in the last 10 years, I've been listening quiet, quieter and quieter. Um, I'm sure that, things have changed. I, well, I know things have changed cause I can't, I can't listen as long as I used to be able to. My ears will flatten quicker than they did. Right. Just fatigue. But, yeah. They, I can hear them flatten, but I, I, I've learned how to recognize it pretty well, you know? And yeah. so, um, I still feel like, uh, like I know what I'm listening to and yeah. that's the main thing, you know, knowing, um, Knowing your knowing room, what, also. knowing what I'm listening to is important. So, ha, duh. <laughs> yeah, knowing that room there too is a room you built. Yes, yeah, and I'm still working the bugs out of that. My, uh, you know, uh, but it is nice after so many years of walking into somebody else's room, and you know, constantly being in different rooms. It's nice to be in the same room all the time, and knowing right. that oh, I hear some weird. I hear a weird reflection that I didn't hear before. Oh, I've got to fix. I got to find out where that's coming from. You know, so I, I can kind of refine stuff a little easier. So has over the course of 30 or 40 years of making records, has the, has the way you mix records changed because of the different media formats that have been introduced over the decades? Oh uh, yeah. Um, you know, started starting out, you know, recording on tape, going to vinyl. Right. Uh, you had to think, especially uh, vinyl, you had to mix way different um, than you do now. You had to watch the low end a whole lot more carefully because you couldn't put low end um, left and right in a stereo image because it would make, you know, it would make the groove in the vinyl, you know, spaz out. Um, and then you had to think about side A, side B, all that kind of thing. Um, uh, and that was just the, the big picture, you know, the, the little stuff is, uh, mm, uh, I don't even know what the little stuff is, but yeah, it's a different, it's a different mindset. It's kind of, it was kind of a slow progression for me. You know, I, you, you had, you had, you know, to do things and the whole recording process is, was way different, you know, cause so many kids, kids so many kids nowadays <laughs> so many so many artists nowadays um they'll record a click track then lay down a guitar and then put drums to it you know it's all done separately whereas you know me you know i i like having the band come in and play as a band first sure and then go back and fix things so we get kind of get the band vibe recorded first um th- that's a big change from between now and then so is, but uh, I guess, so originally you're you're mixing for vinyl and people were occasionally listening to records on headphones then, but they were the big old like OSHA hearing protection looking headphones, right? Right. Uh, and then 
uh, the compact disc came along and, you know, people were still using like, con- like I guess in the 70s and 80s, you'd still see the occasional console stereo system, but people are using like modular hi-fi stereos at home if you had some dough, but you're mixing for all these different scenarios, right? Now, shit, people, I mean, people listen to their music a lot on their, you know, it's so annoying and it's so disappointing yeah. to imagine, but do you do you even consider that that might be a way that folks digest music while you're mixing? Um, not so much. I mean, I pro- maybe I should, but uh, I just... I mean, I, I don't I'm, think you should. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think uh, uh, it's possible that in mastering afterwards, uh, you know, they'll master for streaming and they'll master for right. for other things. But, um, uh, you know, oh, I'm just so used to hearing that. this set of speakers. Um, I listen, I, I hear what other people do. I listen to their stuff on the same speakers. So if I can reference my speakers to what other st- to other stuff, you know, uh, then I'm fine. As long as I, I know what that reference point is, I'm good. Is it cheeky for me to ask you who you're, who, do you have a favorite mixer? Do you have someone that you admire as a mixer? Um, I've always loved Brendan O'Brien's stuff. Um, you know, he just, uh, he always gets the song, you know, um, yeah. uh, and he's mixed a thing or two for me. Um, and I've just always, you know, I've always loved how he, how he approaches. I tend to approach things from <clears throat> a technical side and sonically, he tends to approach it musically, you know, and I have real, I've always appreciated how, how he's able to capture the song so well. He's a great guitar player. He's a great everything player. He play, I think he can play everything well. I, Is that right? As far, as far as I know, yeah. He's a good. He's a good dude. I I I never met him. That's he's one guy I never met. Yeah, he's uh. He mixed uh, Olymp Biscuit record for me, um. And uh, uh. And I run into him at the studio. I, I use in LA um, I'll run into him quite a bit. And so he's, we're, I don't know if we still are, but we were managed by the same person for a while. Yeah. So. Uh, do you have anything on the books that is, is uh, okay for you to talk about right now? I no, I don't have anything that uh, I don't have anything planned right now. Um, the, these days, I mean, it used to be where I, w- I would know two years in advance what I was going to be doing That's these crazy. days. These days it's different. I just, uh, I'll do a job for a while and then I'll just enjoy my life. And all of a sudden I'll get a phone call and I'll be doing another job for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> You're like a hitman uh, in his, uh, uh, I don't know what I am, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know what I am, but, but, uh, I, I much, much prefer being able to just do whatever I feel like doing and still have some, you know, phone calls coming in. So it's, it's nice to, to mix it up. I like that. I like that. Um, Terry, I, I, I think we've been on the phone for almost two hours now. We, I've had you on the line and I appreciate you giving me so much time. Oh, I know. I got to pee, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) I can hear my dogs crying on the other side of the barn door here. Oh, I heard, I heard him too. Um, I also heard my garage door open downstairs and Gail took off. So she's had enough of it. So <laughs> well, you should, uh, will you tell her I said hello? I will. Great. I, yep. She's the best. Yes, she is. Yeah. Did you say how many years did you say you had uh, your anniversary? 31 years. Um, been years. together probably 33, 34. So, I love that. Uh, we got married and the next day I had the guys from mother love bone <clears throat> rehearsing the songs for the record in our living room. on acoustic <laughs> guitars. That was the day after our wedding. Is that right? Yeah. That's... That was the honeymoon. That was the honeymoon. 
that's from where I'm sitting, and that's a pretty sweet honeymoon. Uh, Gail wasn't as thrilled as you seem to be, but um, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. I was busy back then. <laughs> what does she listen to in the car? I don't even. I don't. I don't. What's she into? She listens to. She listens to different things. I don't even know really. Um, when we're riding in the car together, we're listening to gangster rap. Gangster rap. No, I like blues. You know, when I'm just when I, like I said, when I don't want to think about what I'm listening to, I like old, old stuff. Actually, old anything. I like like stuff before I was born or very. You know, I like stuff that would be very unusual for people to to hear these days anywhere because you come up with new ideas that way right gail's not popping off like cardi b or two live crew or anything though i don't think so but she probably would if she could so she might surprise you yeah when you're not like probably right now you're up here she's out for a drive she's out yeah. <laughs> Out for a drive, driving the mini, listening to gangster rap. Right. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know when I'll be back in the area, but I sure would like to hang with you uh, when it's, when the coast is clear and, uh, yeah. And I'm yeah. Well, I, you, you know, you'd let me know when you're coming back and I'd love to do it too. I know a lot of records get made over here, um, in Woodstock too. Yes. Turns out they have some decent studio. Do you ever work over there? I, I had the opportunity to work at Bearsville once. Yeah. Um, and what happened? Oh, uh, it was a Limp Bizkit song that they were doing like for a movie, for Live and Let Die or something for some movie. I can't remember what it was. Oh, Mission Impossible. That's what it was uh -huh. um, back in those days. Uh, and uh, I was mixing something else in L.A. They were gonna fly me out there to do that but same label they told me to stay in la and they had brendan do do that song with limp Bizkit because he was already on the east coast so anyway right. uh no i have not worked up there before. well it's I, only... i've worked in connecticut though i did uh i did a bunch of stuff at the carriage house in stanford connecticut i feel like i rem like maybe you went to connecticut after you made our record no, 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 I don't think or so. Maybe this right was before? all um all late eighties. I did uh I mixed the first Pantera record there. Oh. Um I re I recorded a number of heavy metal bands. I uh, did some overkill records up there. Oh rad. <laughs> yeah. So I did a I did a number of things up up there. Um Oh, Connecticut's the, you know, weird. Just man. in one little three year segment, I think. Uh well, next time you're over here, I mean, I'm very close to Connecticut and I'm forty five minutes from Woodstock. If you ever find yourself working over here, keep that in mind. I will. I got a Absolutely. bunch of weird instruments if you guys need some weird <laughs> sounds. I got all kinds all right. of fretless weird shit. <laughs> uh I you will know. do that. I don't know if I'm going to be up there. I don't know if I'm going to, how much traveling I'm going to do. You never know, but any of us. Um, most of the stuff has been West coast for the, for a lot of years now. So yeah, the hippies on the East coast are a lot different, man. I just don't like the humidity. <laughs> the humidity kills me. Yeah. I grew up rough. in it. It's rough. Huh? It's rough. <laughs> I know the humidity will kill you. And I work in a bottling plant. So oh, geez where my little station in the bottling plant is where I do my iced coffee stuff. It's like next to the boilers. Oh, geez. So it's, you know, if it's 95 degrees out and, you know, 60% humidity inside, it's like 170 or 107. <laughs> it's like a hot yoga class. It's like 107 degrees and, you know, 75% humidity. Yeah. Well, you just are, it's like you jumped in and out of a lake 20 times by the time you walk out at the end of the day. Yeah. I don't miss, I don't miss that. that Come on by anytime. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like no. you'd have a great time. Oh, well. <laughs> well, uh -huh. um, I can't wait to hear the rest of this, this new record. I, that song, the Ohm song sounds amazing. Uh, I love the song. 
Uh, and this is, um, feel, it seems like, uh, is this the, is this sort of a, is this a return to form? Do you suppose, would you call it a return to form with the two of you guys? Yeah. Well, you know, we've known each other for so long and been working together for so long. It was, it's kind of, they're like family, you know, I've known them since they were riding bicycles to the studio, to the rehearsal space. Right. Um, you know, my kids grew up knowing them. So it's, it's definitely family. Um, and I, you know, who knows what'll happen in the future, but, um, you know, we, we get along, we talk, we communicate really well. And as long as they feel like I can accurately represent what they're doing, I'll keep doing it as long as I can, as I, I feel like I'm contributing to them also. So, um, but it was this record was really, really fun to do. I mean, it was just like, you know, it was very, very easy. Right. So. Well, uh, again, I'm, I can't wait to hear the whole thing. So, uh, yeah, there's some good songs from definitely some really, really nice ones on there. So, well, Terry, thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's good to catch up and thanks for sharing a bunch of stories. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. I appreciate it. This will uh it'll come out next Monday. I'll let you know. Okay. I'll I'll go in. You'll take out all the dumb stuff, won't you? I'll just cut out a lot. You know, I never used to. I used to just like from the very top to the very end, it was just like, here's the conversation. <laughs> but uh I'll go in and you know, Mostly me going, uh, uh, so, uh, remember that time you said, uh, the love you make is equal, you know, I cut out that stuff and, uh, so that I seem only, uh, like a fanboy and not like a dumb fanboy. <laughs> well, I, if you can take out all the dumb out of me, uh, I'd appreciate it because, it, you'd be at risk of not having any interview at all, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> not true. Yeah, anyway. Not true. Uh, all people right, are going to love to hear this stuff. So thank you. All right. Well, it's good talking to you and, um, miss you back here, but I'm glad you're doing good on that side. Yeah. Things are good, man. Things are good. Yeah. I'll see you on the internet. All right. <laughs> okay. Man. Have a good day. All right. Bye. Bye.